So, hello, Nick Smith here, speaking to you from London. Welcome to number 18 in our series of Alpine Clubcasts, and the first in a, an exciting autumn season of three. Today, we have another stellar cast of climbing connoisseurs, Charles Sherwood, Calvin Torrance, and Ian Parnell. They're each going to reflect on what makes a great route in their different areas. The Seven Continents for Charles, Ireland for Calvin, and then British Rock for Ian. I really hope you enjoy it. If you're watching live on YouTube or Zoom, uh, please add any questions for tonight's speakers to the chat as we go along, and we'll try to get those answered at the end. And as usual, anyone in Zoom, you will be unmuted at the end for any applause, and do stick around for a chat. So, first tonight, we're joined from Hertfordshire by Charles Sherwood. Charles is a full-time student at the LSE, although perhaps not your typical student at 61 years of age. He's climbed in the UK, the Alps, and all around the, the world, and he's recently published Seven Climbs, Finding the Finest Climb on Each Continent. The book might be described as an attempt at the thinking man's seven summits. Proceeds all go to a Himalayan charity, which I think Charles will tell us more about. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Um, yes, this is this is the book, um, seven, uh, seven Climbs, Finding the Finest Climb on Each Continent. It's, um, uh, there's lots of photos of which I hope to show you some this evening. And I think some very nice, wonderful uh, maps and topos created by Andy Kirkpatrick. Um, the book is published by Vertebrate in Sheffield and is available from Amazon. Um, and as Nick says, the proceeds, at least all my proceeds, the author's proceeds, are going to the Himalayan Trust UK, um, which is a charity dedicated to improving the health and education of the mountain people um, of Nepal. So hopefully that will prove a suitable Christmas present for somebody. Um, the origins um, of my story really lay in a series of attempts that uh, I made with Mark Seaton on the north face of the Eiger between 2005 and 2007. Um, these involved um, uh, uh, these involved a, a quite significant storm on the uh, Hinterstoisser Traverse. Um, a case um, of frostbitten genitalia. Uh, yes, you heard that correctly. Um, a helicopter rescue from the uh, Swallow's Nest bivouac. That near death under the wheels of a train. You heard correctly again. Um, and injury through rockfall and a subsequent um, ascent of the second ice field with a shattered headlamp in total darkness. Um, all of that was followed by near failure here on the waterfall pitch. Um, and uh, only matched by delight and the sheer thrill really of the traverse of the gods and the white spider. Um, and then a nervous teetering along the Mitteleggi Ridge and ultimately success. Now, the Eiger Band has been the subject of, of quite a lot of presentations at the AC. So I'm not gonna go through the detail of this. If you'd like to read that, then it's all there in the first chapter of the book. Instead, I'd like to focus on what followed because it was as I descended from the Eiger um, that it struck me how we had climbed what is surely one of the iconic routes in the world. And yet during those four days had not seen another soul. Um, I couldn't help but note this was in stark contrast to the seven summits, which are fine climbs, but um, now probably represent the seven busiest climbing venues in the world. It, it, it dawned on me that perhaps we could find another seven climbs, um, not the highest, 
but the finest route on each continent. In short, the best seven climbs in the world. And for the next 10 years, that's what I tried to do. Um, the, uh, I'd like to just focus on two of those climbs this evening. Um, like the Eigerwand, both of these climbs, um, or both of these routes have an essential quality that I, I feel is, is crucial to any truly iconic climb. And that is a relationship um, with history, um, with the people that went before, a human, uh, human story. So let, let me start with South Georgia in Antarctica. Um, famously, uh, a century ago, Sir Ernest Shackleton sailed um, and rowed in a 22 foot open boat to South Georgia before making the first ever traverse of the island. Well, our team, um, jointly led by Stephen Venables and Skip Novak, um, was sort of inspired by the same spirit, although seeking a significantly lower degree of hardship. Uh, we set off from the Falklands and after four days sailing, uh, reached the old um, uh, whaling town of Gritviken on the north coast of uh, South Georgia. There we found uh, 12 members of the British Antarctic survey team, but otherwise had the 100 mile long island entirely to ourselves. It is an extraordinary place. Um, and uh, I'd like to just show you a few images because it really is very special. Um, this is the um, um, Whalers Church um, on the outskirts of Gritviken. Um, this is Stephen Venables um, approaching uh, Black Peak. This is uh, Stephen Venables uh, striking a rather fine pose. This is not Stephen Venables. And this is arguably the most beautiful spot on the whole of the whole of South Georgia. It's Larson Harbour. And if you look very carefully in the center of the photograph, you can just make out um, the Pelagic Australis, our yacht and uh, very comfortable mobile base camp. Um, but soon, uh, like Shackleton, we were locked in the ice with a fierce easterly wind blowing the ice flows into uh, Cumberland Bay. And, and we were locked in for four days. Um, eventually, uh, we were released um, and like Shackleton again, we were able to complete a coast to coast traverse of the island, albeit in our case at the even more remote southern end. Um, this involves skiing and skinning with pulks, these sledges, over nine glaciers and seven coals, um, a, a complete traverse of the Salverson range. We had uh, food for 10 days, it took us 12, and uh, we were reduced to what I can only describe as birdseed. Occasionally uh, the weather was bad, um, but generally uh, it was worse than that. Um, importantly, there was no prospect of rescue. Um, one is used in the Alps to the nearest helicopter being perhaps 800 meters away. Well, in South Georgia, it's 800 miles away and it is not coming to get you. So if things get difficult, plan A is self-rescue and plan B is to make plan A work. Um, and things did get difficult. Um, there was one particular incident on the Spensley Glacier right in the heart of the Salverson Range, the interior of the island, um, when in a matter of minutes, the conditions changed from near total calm to a regular 50 knot plus wind with much stronger gusts. 
Um, we were knocked off our feet. Uh, we could barely see, barely speak, and for a time at least, barely think. We did know though that we needed to erect some kind of protection. I mean, the, the heat was already being sucked from our bodies. Um, we couldn't though erect the tent on the open glacier. Um, it would just be too high risk. A tent, as you know, is rather like a sail. And even with five of us, um, it was doubtful that we would be able to hold on to it. So we first built a protecting wall of ice to shoulder level and then uh, erected a single tent in the lee of that and squeezed the five of us in for the night and the following night. Um, so that was, that was quite an experience. Um, happily though, uh, the weather did, uh, did significantly improve um, and furnished us a truly magnificent view of what is one of the world's last true wildernesses. Um, I mean, to put this in context, probably less than 30 people have ever been here. Um, that was our last view of the Southern Ocean behind me. Um, and we turned back inside inland again, uh, picked our moment. We had to sit out more bad weather for a couple of days, we picked our moment and squeezed our way through the Ross Pass um, safely, albeit um, after, uh, after Stephen Venables uh, went into a crevasse attached to his pulp. Um, but we did reach safely the North Coast and this was day 12, our first view of St Andrews Bay, our destination and our rendezvous point with the boat. Um, so let me change gears and take us from cold to hot. Uh, in North America, there is one climb which above all others, um, uh, stands above all others, I think in my mind at least, for its history and its folklore. Uh, the nose on El Capitan. Um, Alex Honnold describes El Capitan as the most impressive wall on earth. And in the late 50s, it was the scene of an intense rivalry between two characters straight out of central casting. Um, the careful, sober, meticulous planner, Royal Robbins, and the carefree, womanizing playboy, Warren Harding. Well, the playboy won, and after 45 days, completed what is widely regarded as the greatest rock climb in the world. Uh, we tackled it in a team of three, which is really ideal for this kind of aid climbing. Um, uh, that's uh, me, the scruffy one on the left, um, uh, Max Beergosh on the right, and Andy Kirkpatrick in the middle. It took us um, six days to get up and down, and we slept on this thing, uh, a portal ledge, um, which is actually remarkably comfortable. I'm always asked um, what happens if you roll off in your sleep well, you don't die um, because you never take off your harness and that is always tied into the safety system. Having said that, it would make for quite an awakening as you blinked your eyes gazing into the abyss below. And uh, this is roughly the view you'd see. Um, the climbing is spectacular. And this is Max on the lower reaches of the nose. This is um, Andy executing the King Swing. So in the upper right hand corner of this photograph, you should just be able to make out a ledge, with Max and myself on it. We've lowered Andy from there. And he is then running to and fro across the face. Um, I think it took him about five swings of the pendulum, which is roughly the same as it took Warren Harding by report in 1958. Um, eventually, um, Andy was able to grab and secure a hold on the left, climb up from there and bring us across. And this is, uh, this is me on the last real obstacle on the nose, uh, emerging from under the great roof. One of the peculiar things about El Capitan 
is that after spending days in the sheer verticality of this face, uh, you emerge onto a flat top uh, with a tourist path down the other side. Um, when I explained this to my wife, Rosemary, she commented, ah, even more pointless than I thought. Um, well, I, look, I hope that's given you a taste for the Seven Climbs project. Um, just one, um, one final remark. I mean, this was something of a tick list. It was a, a group of climbs that I very much wanted to do. Um, but in many ways, it was less about endings than beginnings. And that was particularly true of El Capitan. Um, before the nose, I had barely done any A climbing and I came away hooked. Um, and uh, I, I uh, returned the following year and Andy and I again climbed El Capitan, this time uh, by a slightly more technical route, Zodiac. Um, and this is uh, me actually nearing the top of Moonlight Buttress, another iconic climb, in this case in the Zion National Park. So look, thank you very much uh, for your interest and let me return you to Nick. Thanks very much, uh, Charles. I uh, really enjoyed that. Must, uh, must get hold of a copy. Um, good stuff. So next tonight, we're, we're off to save us some Irish climbs. And we're joined by Belfast man Calvin Torrance, who's basically the godfather of Irish climbing. Calvin has been climbing for almost 60 years, and he's climbed in Ireland, Britain, the Alps, the Himalayas, Alaska, and the Andes. And he's a member of the British Mountain Guides Association. He's always been interested in new routing, and at Fairhead, which is his favourite crag, he and his wife Claire have put up over 100 new routes, and they continue to add an extra couple of first ascents every year. On one of my two visits to Fairhead, I was struggling up a route called Midnight Cruiser uh, when Nigel and I met Calvin and Claire, who were making an E2 next door called The Embankment look uh, incredibly easy, I must say. So it's great to see you again, Calvin. Thanks for joining us. Over to you. Thanks, Nick. And hello, everyone. I'm Calvin Torrens, and I'm going to tell you something about the, the great climbing we have in Ireland. Uh, there are lots of good climbing uh, all over Ireland, north and south. I'm just going to mention three of them briefly, then move on. Now, this is Aladi in the Burren uh, on the uh, west coast of Ireland in County Clare. It's a limestone crag, beautiful limestone. It almost have a, a gritstone feel to it. And this area is the Ireland Wall, which is... Uh, an easy approach, ledges at the bottom, single pitch, with lots and lots of uh, excellent three-star routes. But the classic routes and the one with a bit of adventure is further across in the photograph with the seas washing in. These are the, the tidal area. This area to the front is an untidal. And it's where the, the sort of famous mirror wall, and that is, the, the classic route there is the ramp that is the main weakness across Merrill Wall. And it's about E1, uh, superb climbing. It's a two pitch route with a belay overlooking the Orin Islands and straight across the Atlantic. Fantastic climbing there. Um, uh, it's about two minutes from the road. Um, and so, really. The, the routes on this wall, they're all sort of three star, but the routes in Murrow Wall, where you have to have in and be there above the, the sea, are much more adventurous. And uh, getting hit by the waves is a, is a regular occurrence. Now, if you just um, move on to the. This is in Glendalough. Um, uh, the main cliff in Glendalough and the Wicklow Mountains. It's one of the primary cliffs in Ireland because it was only an hour from Dublin. But it's an old school, school type crag, uh, beautiful granite, um, not too steep, 
lots of ledges for good belays and that. And it has the, the iconic uh, route up the center of the route, just to the left of the, the climber in red, which is Spilligan Ridge. Um, it was the hardest climb in Ireland for a long time. And the, but um, there are superb severes, VSs, all with um, lovely climbing. The route above the climber in red is to the right, it's a cofficus, which um, there's always a, a bit of debate about which is really the best route, either Spilligan or Sarcophagus. But both of them have fantastic climbing um, and um, well worth a visit. The VESs are superb. Um, and the classic one, Fanfare, Spurvan, uh, there's a step around and Spurvan, which VS, but it's everybody's had an embarrassing moments on it, no matter how hard you climb. It's absolutely terrifying. And uh, we're now we're traveling up to the Morns, and this is a classic shot of the, the tours on the Morns. Beautiful granite, really rough, and again it has that roughness and uh, rounded holes. Again, a bit like the grit, and with roots that you would just love to jump on and uh, you know have a go at and immediately get spit out. You know, but it's, it is this is right on the tours of Burner. Fantastic climbing. There's about two dozen crags all over the Morns. Um, the big ones being. Schlieve Beg and Ben Chrome with the multi pitches. A bit, a bit grassy to start, but really tremendous climbing. Um, and the popular areas like uh, Lower Cove, uh, this King Granite Cliffs, um, and some long walk ins to Schlieve Beg and that, which you know is really remote with fantastic views, uh, but really, really tremendous climbing. And this guy moving across here is Ian Ray, who is continuously developing uh, routes in the morns. Um, still a lot to do. Uh, everything from V diff to E10 going. Now, <clears throat> this takes us up to Donegal in the north, the northeast, uh, northwest. Um, but Donegal is a fantastic area. It probably has most of the crags, the best crags in Ireland. Um, sea stacks, uh, sea crags, major mountain crags, everything in Donegal. Um, and this is on OE Island. Um, and, you know, a classic line, you, <coughs> it's, it's just been done recently, and it's called uh, uh, Lip, Lip Rider. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you can see where the line goes and uh, hopefully where it might go. So it's, just, it's, it's superb climbing and superb granite. Owe Island, um, it's easy to get out to. And again, there's constant development and it's full of really uh, fantastic climbs um, and beautiful golden granite. Can differ in places, you know, sometimes it's solid, but the sea can rot away. But, and everything has to be upsized into um, where things look okay, but until you get onto the ledges and belay and you realize there's only one way out and that's either the climb out or Jumar out or things go wrong. Like on a climb like this, your, your skills for rescue want to be good. Close by in the other island in Donegal, is Gola. Um, both of these islands uh, are easily accessed by boat um, and there is accommodation and good camping. But like, like all the, the, the good lines, you know, um, it's, it's looking at them, there's no, there's no doubt in where they go, there's no mystery about them. You know, you upside down and you get stuck into the crack and this vanishing point um, Beautiful, again, just like a way, beautiful granite, really, really fantastic climbing. And again, there's constant development on these islands, as with a lot of places in Donegal. 
and so it's worth keeping keeping a check on uh, the recent guidebook or the locals will tell you what's new and what's been done. Now, to move into the mountain crags of uh, Donegal, this is the Poison Glen. Uh, it was very popular in the 50s by the um, Harold Drasdo and uh, Evans and Alan Austin and people, and it's been neglected since the 50s. It's only in the, the last couple of years that uh, it's been, been getting a new lease of life. And these are three new climbs on it. The other climbs that intertwine around those um, are Nightshade, which was the classic climb uh, put up by Alan Austin and Evans and Drasdell. And there's a few other routes around here, but these are three new routes. Beautiful granite. Um, they were called, there's no easy escape routes on them, and they're everything a classic route should be. Um, route finding, um, you know, good gear, fantastic belays, looking over the poison glen, and you're going to have it to yourself. Um, it is very, it's very seldom you'll see people in here. And the other big thing about this, these, is, is sitting on the belays and looking around me, trying to spot routes, you know, um, uh, you know what could go and what could because there is still a lot of development to be done. But this middle line is about e one five b and the others are slightly harder. And, and again, it's, it's a long walk in and fantastic views, but superb climbing. If you can go for the, the old routes from Drasdo and Maxwell on the other buttresses, which are big uh, vegetated um, long routes, uh, some of them, uh, you know, uh, 500 meters of, uh, of climbing, going from grass ledge to a piece of granite to another grass ledge. And uh, it's really adventurous climbing and you have, a, you have the place to yourself all the time. And this is a type of uh, route. This is Michael and um, Mihal. And, you know, you won't be seeing granite like that for a while uh, until the pandemic lifts and, <laughs> and we get back to Yosemite. But it is superb climbing. And you can see the roots have been uh, cleaned of vegetation. Um, and th they don't require great deal of cleaning. Um, in the cracks because of granite, things don't grow that well in them. But really, really superb climate. And around Donegal, I mean, you have the Poison Glen, you have Loch Belshade, which again is uh, tremendous climbing, and Loch Barra, um, all these big mountain crags. But what you do have is uh, midges. Uh, and, and up to the Scottish uh, type, you know, they're really vicious, you know, they'll, it is, it is a case of opening the tent door in the morning, looking out, deciding, yeah, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, they can be really vicious. Now, this is jumping across the country um, to uh, my home ground of Fairhead, and it's, uh, this sea cliff just keeps uh, delivering good routes. But could you picture walking along the bottom of that and the, the only standard that you and your mates could climb I, on a good day with the wind behind you would be 5A. You know, it, it's, um, that's what it was like back in the early 60s, um, walking along here. You just, uh, you know, uh, you, you're just way out of your depth. It's on the, the Northeast coast near the town of Valley Castle and looks across straight to Rattling in Scotland. The descent gully is that uh, obvious cleft on the right. Um, I, this is the, the um, Wall of Prey uh, area, um, <clears throat> which we used to drop down and around to get into the other routes. But, uh, Arnie Strapkans, who more or less gave it its name uh, in 79 when he climbed the route straight up the middle 
uh, a fantastic achievement and still a really popular route. This, this face now is littered with um, E7s, E6s, but Arnie got the weakest link going through and done a fantastic job. It's slightly harder now. Um, uh, it's E5, it used to be E4, but the, some of the columns fell away and made it a bit harder. And the routes that the uh, climbers are on is uh, a couple of ESs at Jelona and Chieftain. Uh, really, two pitch routes, really good, beautiful climbing you know, and very easy access. This is at the top of uh, Walbert Prey. You can see the climber um, making his way up the top. And it does get the evening sun. It's, um, uh, it's where people head for it, it, the last part of the day. It really uh, gets superb weather. When the weather's good, it, it really lights up. The other is a good, the other uh, kind of route that goes across it was by Pat Little John, um, above and beyond another. Uh, and it, the thing that delighted us with these routes, Arnie's route and Pat's route, is that there were um, trad climbers who didn't use chalk and uh, were climbing in the style that we were trying to hold on to in Ireland. So there was no um, bad feelings about them grabbing the good routes. You know, was, we were delighted to see them. Now, those routes, like <clears throat> Waller Pay, are a bit intricate. Um, and some of the routes, uh, like these two, um, are, you know, anything but subtle. They're but as subtle as a butcher's cleaver. You know, they, um, they're just straight lines, and that's the way a lot of the climbs are in Far Ahead. There's no wondering where they're going to go next, unless you're into the much harder routes, which uh, we drop us inside the wall on the right, um, which is by the E7. But these routes, Hurricane on the right there, put up by Paul McCune in the 60s. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Equinox. <laughs> and um, on the left, Salango. Um, both, uh, uh, Salango can be a bit brutal, that crack at the top left, but fantastic climbing. Um, uh, the, the good thing about Salango is that the dragon lands at the top of that in Game of Thrones in season seven. So if you're watching it, you can see the route coming in. Um, really, really, really uh, uh, superb, great positions. And you can look across from the BLS to Scotland and further down the crag, you can even see the lights in uh, and the Mullican Terror. It's, um, this is Cucullin and Ronin Meg and uh, Waste Deep and Alligators. But Rory Meg is a really, really good VS5A route that goes up there. And when you're looking at a route, you don't want to be sandbagged. If something is 5A, it has to be 5A. But it's great if it's uh, 5A and it looks like E6. You know, like that, that shot in um, Hard Rock, the old one, of the gob and the dragon. Uh, you know, j just, it's just hard to believe that those climbs are just 5A. They, they look horrendous. And that's, that's a good, another good thing about looking up a climb. Uh, Kukulin takes the big cleft going up and left, and Ryan Meg goes up onto the um, rump, obvious rump. And the, the climber is uh, making his way across eventually into a, another route on the left. Um, but some of these routes, when we first came to Fairhead, we attempted to aid them. I mean, that was a thing in the early 60s, if it looked desperate. I uh, know you could stick a couple of pegs in and try and put it. it we uh, never succeeded in that either. All right, further down the crag, uh, this um, a classic, one of the few climbs that you'd be queuing for um, is um, Blockbuster. Um, this is just the the errata of it with the, the climbers on um, morphine and chocolate. Now in this area, there's a bit about eight new routes being done over the last uh, year or so, and superb climbing. The, the, the thing about here is that you you have to clean the routes, you have to go down and knock the blocks off, and that and it can be a lot of hard work 
but it's it's well worth it. The the um, the quality of the rock is, is absolutely superb once you get down to it because it's basalt, um, and where the lighting is, it's incredible. But it, it is again uh, very rough and, and fantastic friction. But here I sort of um, sort of strongly recommend a lot of the uh, the climbs in this area, especially this savage thing, uh, puffing and chocolate. To the left of the, the cliff, the cliff is about five kilometers long, and this is the left hand side. This gets the sun in the early morning, and again, where the where the cliff gets the sun, it is um, clean uh, rock. It's there's not so much light in our vegetation, and it's the same on the right hand side when it gets the the late afternoon sun, and this is sandpiper, and the, the brass or, uh, area, and the other classic um, route is the climb around the red. You can just see the, the red person. That's Jolly Roger, um, John Codling, uh, uh, Martin Manson and John Codling. Right? Sorry, Martin Manson's route, yeah. Um, it's a tremendous climb. The rock is really uh, sharp and uh, perfect uh, crimping territory. Um, really, really tremendous climbing. And this was the first area that we went to when we, when we uh, visited Fairhead, um, trying to climb routes on site, um, which just didn't work out. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, sort of the route in Fairhead for most E1 climbers. It, it is the, the classic route, um, Ambalakunda, the secret way. And it, it was tried way back in the 60s. People got into the, the chimney behind the pillars. But uh, Claire and myself found a way out around and left. Um, uh, really, um, really three-dimensional climbing when you're inside it. Uh, the first pitch is about VS. And uh, everybody remembers that. The, the harder pitches above uh, are nothing compared. Really, really difficult. Um, and as you can see, the secure crack lines. The other lines on the left are is Gobon Sir, the stone mason. And this area has been developed quite a bit. There are drag lines going up. The the because the columns um, are set out from the cliff and because the cracks are so deep, everything dries very quickly. So even uh, after rain, you you you'd be able to get uh, the roots done. Um, uh, really fantastic climb. This is the, the columns of uh, uh, um, Grunda, and uh, you know, there's great fun to be had inside those. Everybody climbs it differently, coming from different directions, uh, claiming that they could get protection and claiming that there was nothing. And uh, eventually when you stop, uh, top out on the top of the column on the now it's uh, you know you don't want to go anywhere else you just want to sit there and go over, over the coast really superb climbing now this is this is a drone shot looking down onto the columns and um, you can see the mom see inside them and you can see the the ledges of Fambalagunda and the, the corners just above just below uh, the people at the top of Angobon Sir and the little red lines at the bottom are the new climbs that have been started finishing up. Um, all reasonable grades, you know, E1, uh, hard VS, E2, but there's a couple of desperate climbs that goes up. The that was big cleft to the left of the picture, the dark, dark thing John McCune has done a couple of it's up there. Um, that's that's a that's a quick look at the classics um, uh, of the route around Ireland. I mean, there's there are loads of areas in climbing uh, to climb in Ireland. The cliffs of Mayo, Kerry, um, real adventurous stuff. Um, uh, you have um, lots of areas to be developed. Um, so uh, whenever the the pandemic over. We hope to get the, the meets up again and we, we'd like to see people coming back to us. 
We're always very, very welcome. Over to you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Calvin. That's wonderful um, and amazing, isn't it? Five kilometres of, of, of cliff at Fairhead. We, we, we really loved going there, I must say. And it was great to meet you. So looking forward to coming back. So, folks, finally tonight, uh, we're joined from Sheffield by Ian Parnell. Ian is in love with adventure climbing and he's put up new routes on sea cliffs all over the UK. He has lots of first winter ascents in Scotland to his name, as well as new lines in Greenland, Alaska and the Himalayas. Tonight, Ian is going to talk about one of the most keenly anticipated climbing releases of recent years, his new edition of Hard Rock. And we'll find out next week if the book wins the prize for best guidebook at the Banff Mountain Film Festival. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it was very interesting to see Calvin's uh, slides there of the, how many amazing climbs there are in Ireland, because uh, Ken Wilson, who published uh, Hard Rock originally, um, pondered long and hard about including Irish roots in the edition. And I know Spillican Ridge was one of the climbs that he was considering. Um, I also considered it for uh, my fourth edition of the book. And I, I eventually made the decision not to include any Irish climbs. And the problem was there will just be too many good ones to fit in the book and it, it deserves its own volume. So over to you, Calvin, on that front. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about hard rock. As I say, I was, I was involved in uh, putting together the latest, the fourth edition of the book. And I was very aware that I was uh, stepping in some big footsteps with uh, Ken Wilson. Um, so when, when we set about doing this book, we had to think about whether we were just going to reprint the original or we do our own version of it. And what we decided to do was um, keep as much of the original as made sense. Uh, so we, we, we actually got rid of a couple of uh, aid routes, which are now free climbs, but basically the heart of the original book is there. But I added on uh, 13 new additional climbs. And uh, to make those selections, I had to think about what makes up one of the great uh, climbs. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, what uh, um, what criteria I use to make that, that kind of selection. And the first thing I had to do was I had to try and think like Ken. I, I wanted to very much keep his uh, spirit uh, with the book. And um, so many of you I'm sure will, will have met Ken um, during his lifetime and uh, know that he was a very forceful thinker. Um, he had very strong opinions and he passionately um, was able to uh, uh, argue them uh, and uh, quite often win the argument. Um, so you would think that finding the best climbs is a relatively straightforward task. After all, when you climb a route, you know when you climb a really, really good route, you know you've climbed something magnificent. But it's not always as simple as that. I mean, this, this climb, the Old Man of Hoy in Scotland is a good example. Um, for me, it's one of my favorite climbs in, in Britain. But I, I, at the beginning of the lockdown, actually, when the book came out, I remember having a, a very forceful debate um, with another very well-traveled climber who thought that it was awful it was at best a one star route. And I think it's important when you're thinking about what is a truly great, great climb, you've got to separate your own personal experience of the route, which is obviously very important to you, how you personally feel about a route, um, but separate that from the qualities of the climb itself. So his view was the, 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 the nature of the loose rock on, on the uh, Old Man of Hoy stack meant that it just could never be a great route. Uh, and I argued there were many other um, uh, qualities that, uh, that uh, more than compensated for the uh, not, not, not so perfect rock. 
having said that, this is the last uh, pitch, the great groove at the top, and the, the rocks are actually really excellent there, I think. So I've, I've narrowed it down to tonight to just five qualities I'm going to talk about that I think are, make up a truly great climb. Ken, in his introduction to the book, listed about 11 qualities, which is typical Ken. In the, he, he would take the floor and, uh, um, and uh, uh, head forth. So I've, I've narrowed it down to four, five different qualities. And the first is the line, the line of the route. This is obviously Dennis Cromlech with the uh, absolutely outstanding, one of the most outstanding lines in Great Britain, Cenotaph Corner. You can just see a climber at the bottom in blue there. To zoom in a bit, looking down the climb itself, route finding is not going to be a problem. And I think for Ken as well, uh, the line was one of the most important things. Ken trained as an architectural photographer and he wrote about um, one of the most important things for him was the climber, but set in the architectural setting of the cliff and the route. And very much the ethos I wanted to stick to when I was taking new photographs for the book was to try to put the route first rather than the climber. So I would be showcasing the route itself rather than what a lot of, I feel a lot of modern photographs do is get obsessed with the climber. Um, sometimes the line, well, very few lines are as, as strong as Sentaf Corner. And it's almost as you begin to climb a route that the line unfolds. So this is in the Lake District on Gimmer Crag. This is Engineer Slab. And this is the final groove, which from below is, is a, you can, you can spot the feature, but it's maybe not the defining feature. But when you're in it, you, it you're completely enveloped by the groove and, Below you, the crack just drops down to the ground. So um, it's a really feels a really strong direct uh, direct line. Sometimes, of course, it can be a great pitch or a great feature on a climb that uh, that really sticks in the memory in terms of the line. This is Great Flake on Central Buttress, um, just above the point where the chockstone used to be. Um, it's worth pausing just to get your head around the fact that the first ascent was done in 1914 of this climb. It's an E1 today. Um, in fact, some people think the flake now is a little harder than that. But uh, yes, it's, uh, it's certainly 1914. And it was an amazing uh, achievement. Sometimes it can almost be a non-line. You're climbing the, the, uh, the uh, line of weakness in a in a otherwise blank feature. This is to a uh, great wall at uh, Cloggy. And um, just see the climbers there on pitch two. And hard rock when it first came out in 1974 was obviously uh, some of the tougher climbs of the day. Today a lot of the climbs are are those that within the reach of kind of mortals and admittedly um, Great Wall is one of the tougher ones, E4, but it's still amazing that this feature, which is climbed by things like Indian Face and Face Mecca, you know, the, the terrifying E9s, that there is a line up there. Um, so this, my second uh, quality uh, is the moves of a route, the technical intricacies, the kind of ballet dance of the climbing. This is on uh, down in Cheddar on... Uh, Great Rock, High Rock, sorry, uh, with Coronation Street. <coughs> and it's crossing the, uh, the shield feature, which is about pitch three. And uh, I'm just gonna quote from Jim Perrin's piece in Hard Rock. And he calls this sequence of moves, a commitment to the unknown in an awesome position. And uh, when you've been there, you kind of swing across with your, your hands full of limestone, but your feet kind of pedaling across the shield. It really is a, a very awe-inspiring position. There's another view looking back with the car park um, sort of 200 feet or so below. Um, 
hopefully you can recognise this climb, Joe, Bound, Joe Brown's brilliant uh, Right Unconquerable. Um, a lot of the kind of uh, attraction of Gritstone are the, the beauty of some of its moves, the kind of uncompromising nature of the rock. So again, I'll quote from another Jim Perrin essay in the book. He says, the gritstone essence, living it fully over a few feet of rock, let the never be so short. For me, there are no better climbs in the world. When you've kind of had a go on something like Right Unconquerable, where you have to charge up this flake, lay backing for glory, um, they're the sort of uh, moves that really stick in your memory and uh, um, are a hallmark of a, of, of a great climb. Over onto the limestone, this is debauchery at High Tor, um, a lovely intricate uh, E2. Uh, Nat Allen writing in Hard, Hard Rock described this particular sequence of moves as a rather committing semi layback, which uh, yeah, it definitely feels that way. You've, you've got just your fingertips and you're really having to go for it. So the third quality I, I've, uh, I thought makes great climb is the quality of the rock. And these are the great uh, granite slabs up in Etiv with swastika, the classic E2 there. And um, I don't think it's any surprise that both in Charles and Calvin's uh, presentations that granite featured uh, very, very heavily. Um, it, it, it lends itself to absolutely beautiful rock climbing, very um, uncompromising, fine lines, um, up beautiful features. The other rock, I guess, that rarely disappoints is gritstone. And this is at Armscliff, Northwest Girdle Traverse, Classic E1. Um, kind of like a natural sculpture, something that Henry Moore would create with those big scooping petals of God's own rock. So the fourth thing I've um, put is a kind of double head of stature and status. So this is um, King Rat, 220 meter E. E1 uh, Craig and Dublock, and this is the climbers pulling through the crux on pitch two. And if you zoom away, this is the full height of the cliff, and just above the scree cone at the bottom, you can see some dark corners, and then above that, that, that roof that those uh, climbers were, were pulling through. So we haven't got El Capitan, but we've got some amazing, huge cliffs in Great Britain, and that that stature definitely um, is compelling. This is uh, another of those great Scottish cliffs, uh, the Shelterstone, looking down Loch lo Arne in the background on the Needle Crack. This is a 260 meter uh, route. And um, just to be in that kind of position, you know, climbing up above that exposure, then nestling into the belay, to bring up your, your partner and looking over a scene like that is, is something for me and many climbers, I think adds significantly to the, the quality of a route. And in terms of stature, I don't think it's just about size. It's about presence, I think. And this is uh, at, uh, back on the grit stone at Froggart. This is the Froggart pinnacle, beautiful feature that stands out from the main edge. And this is uh, the Root Valkyrie, uh, Joe Brown's sort of pioneering effort when he was just beginning to make his mark on the scene. And um, it's partly the architecture of the needle, um, the, the pinnacle there. Uh, it's partly also, I think we go on to status. This is Joe Brown Root. It's very coveted for myself and many other people. The history of a climb and who's climbed it really adds to the quality of, of, of ascending that route. This is up in Scotland in Glencoe. Um, this is Carnivore, and this is an alternative finish called the Villains Finish, climbed by Don Willens. And 
every, every for, me, for me and for many clients, I think, the connection you have with certain first ascensionists, you, have, you feels like you're almost having a dialogue through history. You can feel some of the character of the first ascensionists often. And particularly with someone like Don Willems, his roots just seem to have that kind of big, brash, bold character that all the legends uh, speak of. This is over on uh, Ben Nevis. This is the legendary groove of the bat uh, high up on the route. Robin Smith and uh, Dougal Haston's amazing epic ascent, which saw multiple falls down that same groove um, before they finally got up. And it's, th it's those stories, that folklore that I think just build up climb again and again, and it grows in, in, in stature and status. So my final fifth uh, quality, I call the kind of je ne sais quoi, or the X factor. And it, it's a bit less tangible, but you know it when you feel it, when you climb a route. This is Dream of White Horses on Gogarth. See stunning HVS and very near the top of the tick list for many British climbers, I think. And part of it is, if you think about that cliff, the best line on there is probably concrete chimney, big direct bold crack line. On the best rock is probably on when, big open slab. But the route that everyone wants to climb is, is dream. And part of it is you get in positions like this on the final pitch. Part of it is, is it's a big kind of epic um, journey of sweeping round the whole of Wenzorn. Part of it, I think, is probably that amazing photograph of Leo Dickinson's of the first ascent with the in black and white with the big kind of ghost um, ghost waves the white horse tails crashing up towards the the climbers all these things kind of add to the experience and when you get round to a position like this and you look between your feet drop straight down to the sea beneath you, you know that you're on a, a climb that you're going to remember for the rest of your lifetime Same same crag um, over at South Stack now on Gogarth. This is Mousetrap, an amazing E2. But you think about it, it's a kind of non-line. It wanders and zigzags around. It doesn't really seem to have any direction. The rock is terrible. The, the, cl the climbing is kind of bridging and edging, chimneying. It's not beautiful, but it's an amazing quest across unique terrain. I mean, this rock patterns are some kind of Dali-esque piece of artwork that is just a privilege to climb through. And I think the other thing that brings that X factor is sometimes it can depend on what time of day it is, what the, what the, the atmospheric conditions are like. So this is over on the Gimmer, this is the crack and you're looking over Langdale and a, a, a cliff like this kind of commands the whole environment. And in the evening, when you get the right light and it, it glows golden in the Alpen glow, it just elevates that climb to something really special. And so for me, that takes me back to the old man. It's got that X factor and it's what means that, okay, some of the rock is crumbling, some of it, some of the moves are covered in guano. You might get Fulmer ruining your new Gore-Tex or your, your new pair of climbing trousers, but it doesn't matter because this is a feature that just compels to be climbing. It, it's unique. It's unique not in Brit not just in Britain, but I think in the whole world to have a, a pinnacle quite like that rising out of the sea. And I think that's that's very much. Uh, apply to a lot of climbs in Britain that they aren't the biggest, the rock isn't the best, but we've got a lot of, a lot of things that combine together with that X factor to give some of the, the best climbing in the, in the whole world. So I hope you've enjoyed my little presentation um, and uh, when we're allowed to, we can travel a bit more. You get out and tick a few of the, the hard rock routes. If you haven't got the book, it's available from Vertebrae and um, 
I know they're doing some offers on the way up to Christmas. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, really enjoyed that. It's great to see the old man there. Absolutely iconic at the end. And also, uh, I'm particularly chuffed that you, you included a uh, photograph of Paul Winder, uh, Alpine Club member, uh, on the engineer slabs on Gable. That's that's great. I know Paul was really chuffed as well um, to be included. Um, really enjoyed that. So, folks, uh, if you have a question now for our speakers, uh, now's your moment. Do switch on your video uh, and go with your mouse to the bottom of your screen and click on Participants. And at the bottom of that screen, you should see the option to raise a hand. So, and if you're on YouTube, well, or Zoom, in fact, uh, you can also type your question into the chat uh, and we'll get Nigel or, 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 or Michael to, to feed, those, feed those through. So I'll just have a look to see if anyone has um, put their hand up yet. Uh, while, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll kick off actually with a, a question for Ian, if I may, um, um, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you, you had a sort of list already from Ken Wilson, but I was just curious, Ian, if you, if you were to start afresh, as it were, with a, a completely new list, uh, do you think the contents would have ended up being similar? Uh, thanks, uh, Nick. Yes, it is an interesting question that. Uh, I think, yes, definitely it will be similar. In fact, probably it will be a very good case for 75 to 80 percent of, of Ken's selection, maybe more. I think, though, there are certain fashions that held sway with Ken's uh, era that perhaps wouldn't now. So for instance, um, on Booklet of Moore, there's the, um, there's the not the chasm, the, the, the great cleft there, um, which in summer is a pretty appalling route, actually. It's a fantastic winter route. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I, when I was trying to sh uh, shoot photographs for the book, I was obviously ringing around to get partners to come climb and pose on them. And it was, it was a, a surprisingly easy job except for when it came for that route and I couldn't get anyone to pose on it. I ended up having to go up myself alone, set the camera up in a little snow drift at the bottom and solo up the, the first section of it to get some shots. And uh, it was horrifying. Um, I think you know, there's, there's other routes that have suffered a little slanting slab on, on, on Cloggy, for instance. Um, and w we all have our, our own kind of... Um, biases and even Ken had those uh, he was in love with Cloggy not surprisingly he did a fantastic book The Black Cliff and uh, he probably had a few too many routes from Cloggy I think we spread it round but but on the whole he was actually on the money with so many of his selections mm. and I think they, they've stood the test of time and that people still want to climb a lot of those routes. Yeah well thanks yeah and um, well I do hope uh, I hope you come away with the prize next week. Um, <laughs> going up the chasm on your own, I think you know that's de that's dedication to the cause, isn't it? Yes, good stuff. I'll I'll go to Calvin next, actually, with with a question. Um, Calvin, if I may, um, uh, I've slightly been um, prompted by Victor here, but um, um, I've got a bit of a uh, a vested interest in this question, but um, I, I know that you and Claire have, um, have, have a, I think I'm right, a couple of children. Uh, I just wondered how you managed to combine such an active climbing career uh, with having children, Calvin. I, <clears throat> we had to divide our chores and, uh, you know, sometimes we would, uh, uh, like alpine climbing, uh, I would look after the kids in the campsite and Claire would go off to somebody. She'd come back and then I would go off and climb. And then sometimes we made a one day route last for two days so we didn't have to come back into babies. But <clears throat> generally it was, uh, it was a case. In Ireland, we don't have as many uh, sort of potential uh, uh, partners around as you would have in uh, Great Britain. But um, yeah, it was a case of we, we had to share all the chores and, um, you know, climb with other people at times. It was, it was, um, 
and the lads, sometimes we left the lads under uh, a boulder while we went rock climbing. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was it was grand. Um, we were able to share it even here, right? Oh, good stuff. I, I'll I'll be taking notes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> on that <laughs> on that answer. Thanks for that. Um, so amazingly, no questions so, coming in. Uh, yet. One, so, oh, we, I'll put we one do for Charles. One. Um, unfortunately, I can't put my hand up. So, uh, but Charles, um, you've given us three routes. But there are seven um, different ones. What are the other? What are the other ones that um, you might say briefly? Uh, uh, the ones across the rest of the world that you would really recommend? Well, I, I, I thought this question might come up, so let me see if I can actually share a photo or two. So, so this this um, was the um, mountain I climbed in South America. So this is the southwest face of Alpamayo in the Cordillera Blanca in Peru. And the route we took was the French direct, which goes pretty much smack up the center um, of that face. Um, I mean, that gives you an idea of looking back down. It's about to about 70 degrees. Um, in, uh, in Asia, it was uh, Amadablam, the southwest ridge which is essentially the ridge that you can see on the right skyline. I mean, this is a mountain that was, I think when it was climbed in 1961, that's still seen as the moment, sort of the birth of technical climbing in the uh, Himalayas. And uh, that's, that's the high camp. Um, in Africa, we, we, we did actually, in a sense, climb the, one of the seven summits because we did an acclimatization trek to the top of uh, Kilimanjaro um, and then used the, that acclimatization to do a traverse of Mount Kenya. You probably know that Mount Kenya has two peaks, Batian and Nelian, um, second and third highest mountains in, in Africa. And in between, there's this ominously named coal, the, um, the Gate of the Mists. Um, so that was kind of fun because we climbed in, in one week, actually, we topped out on the three highest mountains in Africa. And then finally, um, in Australasia, um, that was the one place I really traveled to without being sure which route I was going to climb. Um, I, I knew it would be in New Zealand because that sort of is the home of Southern Hemisphere mountaineering. Um, but I ended up doing two in the end. This was the... Um, Southwest Ridge is sort of ice climb. This is the Southwest Ridge of Mount Aspiring. And then this was the uh, Linda Glacier route on Mount Cook or Aoraki, um, to use the local name. I think um, Aoraki, the hut to hut, took us, near, took us very nearly 20 hours. And it, was, it seemed a pretty hard climb at the time. So I think um, that took, uh, probably took the top spot for me. Anyway, there we go. Thank you. So I'll, uh, Calvin, I've got another question for Calvin. Um, uh, what's the secret to putting up new E4s on, on Fairhead in your, in your 70s? I gather, <laughs> again, Victor's uh, um, prompted me on this one. What's the secret? Well, uh, can I, I say something while we're working on that? Oh, yes, please. Go the ahead. Go in the ahead. background is the author of this book, which is I'm, I've just got halfway through it and it's quite wonderful. It's um, Mrs. Uh, Torrance, and uh, it describes it describes a little bit of her life with Calvin. <laughs> Fantastic book. It's um, how to grow up, growing up in a nice Catholic uh, origin in the South, and ending up marrying a uh, Protestant Belfast boy. <laughs> Which shows oh, we can hear you, Calvin. The, the, real, the real religion must be climbing. Pardon? The real religion must be the climbing. Oh, it is, most, most definitely, yeah. If there is one. <laughs> yeah. Well, good to have you back. Uh, well, 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 well sorted. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, so my, my question, Calvin, was what's the secret to, to putting up new E4s uh, in your 70s? Uh, well, it's, it's do new routes is that um, you will climb harder if you, uh, 
if you select a new line uh, and you, you're trying something new, you will give it the, the, the full throttle. Like you'll probably climb two grades above what you normally climb because you're not going to give up on it. You know, so new, new routing really does make you climb harder. It's, it's a bit like people going into a competition. You know, they really, you know, pull all the stops out. Whereas if you're doing something that you know is E3 or E4, you, you don't have the same zest, you know, to get going, you know. But when, uh, <clears throat> when the body refuses to move, <laughs> you, know, you, you need something new to make it go. <laughs> um, Kelvin, I think Ian's got a question for you. Go, go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, Calvin, I, I'm just wondering. I mean, obviously in England, Wales, to a lesser extent Scotland, but basically we we've, we've used up most of the rock. Um, yeah. Whereas in Ireland, that's obviously not quite the case. But I'm just wondering. You know, just re not too long ago, the the photo sort of went round the world of the Bejesus Wall on uh, <laughs> Owe Island, yeah. and that made me travel over to Owe. Yeah. I just wonder if there are any whole, not just routes, good lines, but whole cliffs like that, of yeah. that quality still left to be discovered, do you think? Well, not that, um, I haven't seen anything of that quality. I've seen cliffs, like in, in Mayo, there are huge cliffs. Now, I know Mick and Pat and Steve Sustead have been down there, but there are areas that are um, a bit more solid than that. And, you know, there are Donegal in the mountains that is granite of that quality. Like that stuff in the Poison Glen is bloody good, you know. And, and uh, you know, it, it's not all, you know, nowadays most new routes are E6, E7 that have been worked on. Whereas we're, we're finding routes that, you know, are anything from V diff to uh, E2, you know. But, yeah, there is still places to be found, and they're on the coast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a big coastline. It's a big coastline. <laughs> Thank you. Great stuff. From Nick, Nick Simons. Go ahead, Nick. Hi there. Question for Charles. I don't know if I can wait until I read the book to hear if there was a happy ending or not to the frostbite story you alluded to. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to say that that telephone call that it was literally a telephone call from the swallow's nest bivouac to the emergency services in switzerland explaining <laughs> the nature of the injury to the party and why we needed evacuating was one of the more bizarre phone calls um, i've been part of um, it wasn't actually my genitalia it was my partner's and i'm glad to say that everything is in firm working order <laughs> He has, he has some three lovely daughters and uh, everything seems functioning perfectly. Thank you, I'm very glad to hear it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question coming in from YouTube, I think. Nigel, do you, do you want to share that one? Hi, it's from uh, Karis McKnight. Uh, what do Calvin and Charles think makes a good route? Makes a great route? What makes great routes? Um, well, it, it is it, it is the um, uh, the line, and then if it's complicated with route finding, and you know technical, all those things together, I think, you know, and it's difficult to get a single pitch route in, into that category. You know, I always find that they have to be big, multi pitch routes um, in remote crags. For me, that's that's what makes it. When when I was sort of looking for my seven climbs, I guess I guess there are a number of factors. One was sheer beauty. You know, I mean, I personally think that ice face on Alpamayo is is stunningly beautiful, and you know, Amadablam is often described as the Matterhorn of the East. I mean, I just think there is aesthetic appeal is is one factor um, I think an element of challenge um, I, th I think to some extent finding a mountain or a route that caught 
express something of the character of the continent was important. Um, definitely the history. And I mean, I think this is echoing, I think Ian and, and, and I were perhaps echoing this point with each other. I mean, the importance of the history, the people that have climbed before, the pioneers that established the roots, um, that side of climbing has always fascinated me. And I mean, but then also having variety. So um, it, I, I definitely wanted to capture within the same seven routes, um, you know, traditional rock climbing, a climbing, ice climbing, mixed climbing, traveling, a, you know, a journey through a wilderness on a mountain wilderness on skis. Um, I, I think it was, in, I mean, for me, that aspect of climbing, the variety, the you know the, the the different experiences is is a, is a vital part of the whole. Thanks, Charles. Uh, actually, Ch Charles, I had a question for you, um, just because I've not uh, I've not climbed there myself. Um, so once Andy had once you lowered Andy down and he did the the um, King swing. the the swing across, um, you you said that you just followed. Um, I was trying to imagine. If he if he was making a belay below you, um, how he kind of got across to you? No, <laughs> well, you, you, in a you big can't swing. make the belay below. So you have to be confident enough that you can then lead back up until roughly a, a, you know pretty much a similar height is achieved, and, and obviously you can't put any gear in on in, in the course of that or. Uh, unless you take two ropes and um, if you've got a lot of rope, but, uh, but no, you have to get back to a roughly equal height before you can then bring the, uh, your partners across. I see. Yeah. Okay. There's another question. For, uh... Yeah. It's from Kevin Byrne on uh, YouTube. With global warming and other challenges, what does the future hold for alpinism and rock climbing? Yeah, do, Ian, do you want to come in on that one? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I've written a bit about it, actually. Um, I wrote about it in the final editions of Climb uh, and written about it elsewhere. Yeah, I think it's really significant and it's not something to be taken for granted. Um, you know, obviously, you think your mountains are, are pretty permanent structures, but they're not. They're changing all the time. And it's particularly summer alpinism in the Alps. It's I'm sure many of you will have experienced it's it's a very different gain than it was than when many of us started going to the Alps. Um, so there's not just glacial retreat, but the permafrost itself is melting, and so uh, mountains are collapsing. The Drew, for example, is is falling apart. Um, so I do think it is significant. I think it, it it'll. It'll change where we climb, but also it'll, it'll make us think about the um, extravagances we take as alpinists. Um, you know, as alpinists, we're very connected with nature, but we've got to be honest with ourselves. These beautiful things that draw us to travel around the world, we are damaging them by our actions. You know, that global warming, we may be a tiny percentage uh, of that compared with, you know, great factory emissions and things, but we still do contribute to that. And so I think you need to think about um, what adventure means now. And so traveling in, in a uh, sustainable manner to these places, even if it might take you an awful lot longer, is something that seriously needs to be considered, as does not taking, uh, finding big adventures closer to home. And they are there. Um, it's just a, a, you need to have a kind of change of perspective, um, uh, which I think you know, is overdue now. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, Andy Perkins has actually just joined us, and he, Andy's got, uh, he, he'd like to add something. So go, go ahead, Andy. Hi, Ian. I just, uh, and everybody, I'd just like to echo really what Ian said and, and just sort of perhaps take a little review of, of, of this summer season, in, in, certainly in Chamonix. And that is that I've been doing a lot of rock climbing, um, partly because of the whole COVID situation. It's been a lot of valley-based rock or using uplift in order to gain um, uh, 
uh, high mountain objectives, but but there is, uh, as Ian rightly rightly pointed out, with the with the permafrost issue going on, there, there's certain periods when everything which is in the above the post glacial limit, that is to say, around about 2,800 meters, becomes um, really quite unstable and 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 the research here would tend to indicate that there are small frequent rock falls early on in the summer in that area but then large infrequent ones towards the end of the season and so so you need to be very careful about what you do in those in that current in the the area in the altitude zone where permafrost is currently melting um, um, but you know there's still lots of climbing to do um, but but it's a matter of adjusting one's perspective and not necessarily going for the things that um, certainly were in um, Gaston Rebefat's book and perhaps not even in, in the new version. Um, but, but taking into account a very, very rapid change in, in what is going on in the Alps. And then we also, as Ian rightly pointed out, to consider our impact and our contribution to how the, our, our involvement in that activity is accelerating global warming. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Andy. And well, we're really looking forward to your, your talk in, in about three weeks. Me too. <laughs> I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be telling, uh, telling you about that uh, uh, when, we, when we finish. Um, could I go now to, uh, to Rosalind, who we've now unmuted you, Rosalind. So you had a question. Go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I had a question for Ian, but others may want to comment, the other speakers, um, who mentioned the satisfaction of climbing a route that had stature and history, perhaps famous first ascensionists. And I wondered how you compare this with the excitement and the achievement of actually putting up a new route yourself. Thanks, Rosalind. Uh, good to see you again. Um, myself and Rosalind went to Everest together. Uh, uh, um, yes. I've been lucky enough to climb a few new routes um, you know, around the world and in, and in uh, uh, Great Britain. And um, it's one of the most amazing experiences that there can be. I think the difference is kind of illustrated. I had a year when I was based down in Exeter uh, climbing on the, um, the uh, sort of tottering shale cliffs of North Devon and uh, North Cornwall. And I spent almost a year there just climbing new routes. I, I didn't climb any um, existing routes. I was so addicted to climbing new routes. And I had an, it was one of the best times ever of, of climbing for me. But there was, when I look with a sort of a sober light of day at, at those uh, routes, there were tottering piles of choss that no one else would want to climb. To me, they were three, four star experiences, but they wouldn't get stars for anyone else. And I think that's the difference. It's very personal climbing new routes. Obviously, if you're, you're Joe Brown and you get to climb, pick the plum lines um, and climb the real classics, then that's, uh, that's doubly rewarding. I've been lucky enough with a few Scottish winter ascents to have done the first winter ascent of routes that people actually want to go and climb. And uh, that, that, that's a kind of doubly rewarding feeling. Is that answer your question, Rosalind? Is that... Yes, I think so. Thanks very much. Yes. So I'll I'll start to sum up. Um, if anyone does want to interrupt me, go ahead. Um, but yeah, it just remains for me to say thanks very much to everyone, to the three speakers particularly. Um, really enjoyed your talk this evening. Um, our next Alpine Clubcast number 19 is on the 17th of November and is entitled Ski Mountaineering Far Afield. For those who think it's more fun to descend your mountain on skis, we have an evening of ski mountaineering in remote locations with Cathy O'Dowd, Andy Perkins, who was speaking just earlier, and Phil Wickens in the Canadian Yukon, the west coast of Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, do join us for that. Um, also, do have a look at the Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, like and share all the previous Alpine Clubcasts. Thanks all for joining us. Uh, keep safe, keep active. Uh, please unmute yourselves now so we can applaud tonight's speakers. Um, and good night from London. <laughs>